have experiences with algae where we uh, have eaten it as seafood or we've gone out to the tentacles of Santa Cruz and explored um, it that way. Maybe noticed it, but maybe not so closely. I think normally when we go out to the tentacles, we are looking for crabs and sea anemones and sea slugs. And so um, really quickly, I want to make sure that we're all kind of on the same page about what algae is and very briefly share a little, um, little bit about algae. So algae are simple, non-flowering, and typically aquatic organisms. They do contain chlorophyll, much like plants, but they do not belong to the plant kingdom um, because they lack true stems, roots, leaves, and vascular tissue. They are actually part of the kingdom protista. And often when we talk about the larger organisms of algae, because there are single-celled organisms, when we talk about the larger ones, we um, often categorize them by red, brown, or green. So we're gonna be talking um, about a number of algae from those three categories uh, today. And I also wanted to share that the museum's mission is to connect people with nature and science to inspire stewardship of the natural world. And we really, we're gonna be talking about stewardship today. We're gonna be talking about conservation today, but we really believe that in order for people to truly um, feel empowered to do stewardship and to feel compelled to do stewardship, it has to start with a spark of um, curiosity and connection. And so we also um, create resources for people to do that. Um, and during uh, certain times, that might mean bringing people out to the tide pools to explore algae. We've also had workshops where we've used algae as a subject for cyanotypes, which we're gonna briefly talk about today as well. Um, and we've also recently created this guide to local algae that you can find on our website. And we will be sending out an email at the end of this that does have links to, to resources for you to continue um, your understanding of algae and your learning. So I just wanted to share with that, that with you really briefly. Um, but I think it's time for us to get started with the program, um, which is all Kathleen. And so at any point during this, if you have questions, please use either the Q&A function or the chat. Um, and I might ping Kathleen uh, in the middle of her presentation, but we'll definitely have time at the end. Um, and eventually we'll invite Michael in as well and you can ask questions of him. So without further ado, Kathleen, take it away. Okay. Um, so yeah, and like Marisa was saying, this is kind of a new format for us. So um, I'm gonna, we're gonna do a little bit of mix of like some slides and then also me like holding things up to the camera. So if there's something that you wanted to see more of or that you didn't get to see enough of because of the way that I was holding it, please let us know and we will fix that. Um, so one of the ways uh, of connecting to nature that we are excited about is collecting and our collections represent, you know, more than 150 years really of collecting in the Monterey Bay area. Um, and we have a whole bunch of diverse different specimens and artifacts and objects. Um, and within that, we have a beautiful set of herbarium specimens um, and then older uh, herbarium pieces. Um, and then, and if Marisa wants to pull up the slide that we have of a couple of those images. Um, uh, and one thing that I really like about this collection is they're so incredibly stunning um, and visually arresting, even if you know nothing about them. You look at some of the objects that we have on our shelves, you know, even if you like rocks, sometimes it's hard to tell the story behind one, or even if you're really excited about fossils, an unprepped fossil isn't going to be able to speak to you that much. But I think that one of the cool things about these algae pressings is that they are stunning. Um, and because of this sort of confusion about like what algae is and how foreign it is, at least to me personally, it's something I think is really pretty, but um, I don't get to see a lot in my daily life. Um, it's uh, really exciting to be able to dive deeper into that story. And the collections close up oftentimes is about us diving deeper personally or bringing you with us on a personal journey into the collections, but also um, we get to learn more about these specimens um, and objects and artifacts ourselves. Um, and sometimes that means we can make create community connections like uh, that with Michael or um, with other uh, resources that we'll talk about sort of like later in the chat as we get into like the history of like algae collecting and, and algae collecting in the Monterey Bay. Um, so anyway, that is all to say we are going to um, zoom specifically in within the collections uh, and the, within the herbarium and the algae collections to Macrocystis integrifolia. Um, so for those of you who read the blog, this part might be um, a little bit more familiar to you, but don't worry, we're going to expand it out to some other parts of the collections. Um, but Macrocystis integrifolia is a brown kelp. Um, it's a large organism that can grow up to 20 feet, and it's in the order Laminariales. 
So I also might butcher some of the scientific names and I apologize for that. Uh, I think our guests uh, or others can help correct me at the end. Um, and that's generally the group of algae that are called kelp. Other fun names include like the devil's apron or deep sea tangles um, and other really sort of exciting um, and like scary stuff. Um, but one thing that's really cool about these that you can see showcased in this really striking specimen is um, they have all these, we've got these um, different blades that can be um, between 25 to 35 centimeters long. And I guess also for um, context, this is a herbarium sheet. That's, um, this is a standard size for preserving different kinds of plant specimens or algae specimens, which are often included in herbaria because of this historic um, and outdated understanding that they were plants. Um, and so these sheets are usually about 11 uh, and a half by like 16 and a half in size. So like kind of about yay big on me. Um, and so you see that we have in this sheet, we have all these different blades, which is sort of the leaf looking like structures of the algae supported um, by these floats, which we're all pretty familiar with. I mean, this is kelp, we all know what we're talking about. Um, but even though we've probably seen this a lot on a beach, um, these floats are a really important part of uh, why kelp is such a critical part of the ecosystem around the Monterey Bay. Um, and it is because it supports the upper growth of the organism so that you can get kelp forests, which we have a lovely slide of in this next image, um, which was given to us by um, our guest, Michael, who's gonna show up here at the end. And you can see um, that these floats uh, push kelp up to the surface and give you this like really rich um, three-dimensional structure and space for all different kinds of um, plants and animals and organisms to live and thrive in. Um, this is, uh, I, I'm not exactly sure where this particular kelp forest is, but it's important to note that um, Macrocystis integrifolia um, is very similar in a lot of ways to the kelp we're more used to talking about in kelp forests around here, which is Macrocystis pyrifera or uh, giant kelp. Um, there is like some disagreement in the scientific community about whether or not these um, are the same species for a couple of different reasons. Um, a major takeaway is that they are um, both, you know, these large canopy forming structures that confer a lot of the same in, um, uh, benefits to different creatures that want to be like living in them and eating them. Um, and they're also vulnerable to a lot of the same problems. Um, so one of the big differences is in the structure called the holdfast. So if you go all the way down, you know, and again, for these guys, it's about, you know, 20 feet or six meters all the way down to the base of the organism, it's attached to uh, um, rocky surfaces of the ocean floor by a structure called a holdfast, um, which looks a lot like roots, but is not. Um, and you can see that represented in these different um, herbarium specimens that we see here. And like Marisa is like circling one of those. Um, and you can also see how it's really tricky. So from a collecting perspective, if you're gonna go out there and with herbarium specimens, you're like, I wanna get the most representative, you know, um, components of this like plant for example like if you're going out to get like a duck it's easy to get a whole duck um, or to know whether or not you had gotten one whereas with something like algae it's really important that you're getting all these little these critical structures um, like reproductive structures and like the hold fast and like different parts of um, the organism to make sure you're getting a representative picture of it but in the case of an organism like this they're huge so you might need several so we've got several different examples in our collection showing different parts um, of the uh, of the organism. Um, and so that also, you know, we can talk about this a little bit more later if you guys want to, but um, that also relates to sort of the ins and outs of how we collect and preserve algae that has to do with, you know, collecting them in bags with waterproof labels, fixing them with a mixture of formalin and seawater, you rinse them, you press them. Um, we can talk more about what that looks like later at the end if you guys are interested. Um, so, and actually just to, just to say a couple more things about Integrifolia, um, because we've been able to preserve these specimens, which were given to us um, in the early 1970s, um, we we're able to sort of chart the life history of kelp in the Monterey Bay, which is pretty important. Like previous to the last couple of years, you know, um, kelp was kind of seemed more stable. Um, you know, the, the last time it had been, you know, adversely affected by consistent human use was around like World War I, World War II, where it was being harvested for a couple chemicals that were used in the war efforts. Um, but what we're seeing now uh, is that kelp is threatened by a variety of things that we will uh, talk about a lot of environmental stressors that are largely um, climate issues that we'll get into a little bit more when Michael talks about kelp conservation at the end of this talk. Um, but it's important to think about the fact that when these specimens were collected, Kelp was, it was not a problem, uh, you know, in, in 
a targeted or specific way. People weren't necessarily concerned about whether or not it was doing well, which highlights a challenge in natural history collections in particular, where um, you know, to have a good solid record, you need to be looking at things all of the time, even when you don't think that they are particularly threatened or perhaps particularly interesting. Um, so that's an important point to think, keep in mind as we move ahead. Um, and to that end, we have many more specimens in our collection, not just this kelp, um, that are also important in a variety of other ways. Um, and so we just sort of picked some of the more striking ones to showcase a little bit of the diversity that you can see here. So Ulva californica is a seagrass, um, which means that it would probably be delicious. This particular um, species, when you find it in Northern California, is a little bit more elongated, um, whereas when you find it in Southern California, it's a little bit more stumpy. Um, and this is also in you know, the green algae group. And then Codium uh, fragile is also called uh, dead man's fingers or like uh, fat felted fingers or sea fingers, which I think is amazing. Um, and then, oh, did I say, so sea lettuce was Ulva californica, did I? Oh no, I'm sorry, I got too excited. Um, so the sea lettuce is Ulva californica and that's the one that would be pretty tasty and that's the one that you see to the left of your screen, whereas the dead man's fingers and the felted fingers is the one that you see on the right. Um, and these also present just such a striking contrast. It's maybe a little bit hard to see on the screen, but especially when you're looking at these specimens in person, you see this very thin sheer layer um, for the Ulva californica, for the sea lettuce, and then for the dead man's fingers, this is a really spongy three-dimensional specimen. Um, so, you know, that would have led to a couple different preservation techniques, different drying times, and in some cases, different long-term preservation concerns. Um, cool fact about the dead man's fingers is that they were often used as like a, a supportive packing material for folks who were shipping specimens that they collected from the Americas to different parts of Europe. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, and I'll try to straight this time. Uh, so Desmas de Amunda, um is a, a brown algae that's also called brown acid weed um, or also landlady's wig, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, maybe, you know, speaks a little bit to the sort of like somewhat threatening um, nature of this particular species, which is um, which stores um, sulfuric acid um, in its cells. Um, and so that's one that you have to be a little bit more careful when you're collecting or trying to do things with, uh, um, but it's not something that you need to like worry about as you're wandering through tide pools. Um, and then on the right, we have the Procamium cocineum, Far Pacificum. And this is a beautiful, um, sometimes called like mermaid's braid or mermaid's comb, but the mermaid's names get thrown around all the time. And you guys might also have like other names for these if you recognize any of these algae from like your adventures. Um, and this is a beautiful branching red algae that, um, you know, it can be kind of confusing when you're trying to look for it or ID it if you're outside because, you know, in the same tide pool, you can have really delicate, like thinly branched specimens and then you can have like really coarse, like thickly branched ones. Um, but it's also because, uh, I think partly because it's so lacy and pretty, it's one that we see a lot in some of our more historic algae collections that look or, are looking more at the beauty um, of the piece. Um, so another thing that uh, we wanted to talk about these specimens with, like as we look at the different ways that we can create connections here and the different stories these kinds of things can tell, um, is that all of these last four specimens were collected by Julie Packard, um, who uh, I'm sure that we all are aware of is an ocean conservation hero um, and uh, you know leader of Monterey Bay Aquarium um, and you know has many other accolades and also um, got her master's degree in marine biology with the focus on algae at UCSC um, in the 1970s and so we're excited to have a collection that relates to the legacy of such an awesome science lady um, and then also we're excited that, you know, to part of Julie Packard's legacy in addition to specimens like this is also a big commitment to, um, you know, uh, diversity and representation in science. So, um, you know, she's put a lot of, she's worked on a lot of initiatives for trying to make sure that, you know, underrepresented communities are still able to participate in and learn about scientific endeavors, um, which for us also kind of circles back to some of the other collections items we have. And here we're about to get into some more physical objects that you guys might get excited about. Um, because part of looking at the history of like algae collecting is also looking at the history of women in science. Um, because, uh, and we can flip forward probably to the next slide if we want to now. Um, because for a really long time, uh, you know, 
and, and still in some ways to this day, women were excluded from a lot of different aspects of scientific enterprises, but one way that was acceptable for them to engage with it because things were delicate or pretty or because they could be associated with like non-strenuous, easily accessible outdoor tasks where they didn't get too dirty was the notion of collecting plants um, and then also, you know, algae and putting them in books like this uh, Sea Mosses album. Um, so this kind of coincided with the Victorian era, like biophilia is a term that's used to describe this like really intense excitement about nature that a lot of folks were experiencing in the Victorian era, which had a lot to do with a reaction to like increased industrialization, um, with a sense of upheaval about the world and a desire to engage with it through orderliness and classification. And then also from a proliferation of like print technologies and books. And so if we think about things like Laura Hecox's own scrapbooks, people at this time, you know, in the early to late 1800s were getting particularly excited about not just like having books, but creating their own systems of knowledge that they could then put together and adjust um, in books at home. Um, and so you would see, especially like albums like this, you know, uh, they would be homemade, but oftentimes they would be things that you could buy and then you would organize different algae specimens in them or others. We have sea moss specimens that were um, used for all sorts of different kinds of plants. And in some cases, they would be things where you would, you can see in one of the screens here that the location of where the specimen came from is listed with a date. Um, but more often than not in a lot of these albums, especially ones that from the inscription you can tell was given as a gift, um, we see just more artful arrangements. Um, and then we have, uh, you know, there's a lot of different specimens in the collection or objects in the collections that reflect this sort of like artful engagement with algae collecting. Um, and so if we go to the next slide, um, we see this California sea moss poem. Um, and it says, nursed like that, like the plant of a summer garden fair, where gales are but sighs from an evening air, our exquisite, fragile, delicate forms are nursed by the ocean and rocked by the storms. Um, and so one thing that's really kind of funny is you see a lot of the term like moss being used to describe seaweed, um, which, you know, and seaweed itself is not like the technical term that we use now, but it was a term that around like the 1800s as people were getting really excited about nature and thinking about these things as like beautiful um, and engaging with them that way, they got really mad that they were called weeds, um, which comes from like an older, like a uh, British treatise on plant life where someone was like, I don't know, these things just come out of the ocean. So they called them sea racks or like, like a sea, like a shipwreck, just like kind of the flotsam and jetsam that floats up. And so there's all this like poetry and writing um, that m makes it clear that there's an injustice that we would call seaweeds weeds how dare we, they're the flowers of the sea, they're the mosses of the sea, they're beautiful and we should appreciate them. Um, and so if we go to the next slide, we see another one and here you can see that sentiment reflected in the first line, like call us not weeds, we are flowers of the sea. Um, and so it's something that is kind of exciting to see people as they're like getting excited about nature, they're trying to sort of like empathize with like, okay, so we have called this one thing, what else can we call it? How are we understanding it? Um, and it's interesting to see this take the form of these sort of like cute and sweet poem pieces. Um, so if we want to go to, I think the next slide. Oh no, wait, go back, we'll go back to the other ones. Um, I think we're actually gonna take a couple moments. So another thing that I wanted to show you guys from like in terms of physical stuff from the collection um, is we've got, we also have a, a couple specimens where you have people who were in the process of making these sort of wreaths, which often um, ended up, you know, being on invitations or thank you notes um, to different people throughout the area. We have, this one might be harder to see, uh, but we have a souvenir from admission day celebration in Santa Cruz in 1891. And you can see that we have um, all this beautiful, can you guys see that? Marisa has a look. Yeah, so you have um, people taking the time to just see these really elaborate adornments uh, that, you know, sometimes really, a lot of times they were relating specifically to like content about like how exciting the ocean was, but sometimes it was more on like invitations or thank you notes. Um, and then one of the things that we also have that we've got, um, 
And like this was sort of an ongoing tradition that then obviously we appreciate nature still to this day, but in kind of different ways. But one thing that I really like about this portion of the collection is, so, you know, we have these historic books that are like these CMOS albums. Um, and we have a variety that were clearly produced for that purpose. And then these are from the late, you know, 18, um, these are mostly from between like 1870 and like 1885. Um, and then we have um, this book, which uh, if you were able to hold it in person, you can tell that it's like shiny and plasticky and the word sea moss on the cover, similar in style to the way the words are arranged on those books, but it is scratched into this plastic and then covered over with like a green marker. Um, and then you have this sort of like yarn tying it closed, but it's still an album that begins with a poem called Song of the Sea Flowers, um, which I would be happy to read, but perhaps, you know, if you guys want to do a call back later to actually reading more of these seaweed poems at the end of the talk, we can do that. Um, but we have like a couple of different, you know, sort of like specimens in here. Let me make sure I can show you guys one. Um, and it's a set of these sort of different pressings, not necessarily um, in like an artful arrangement style, but laid out beautifully. And then at the end of the book, you can see that there's an inscription that this was made um, by a local woman when she was 89 years old um, in 1963. And so she was born uh, here in 1874. And you can imagine that when she was younger, you know, she must have seen these sort of like purpose built albums still lying around. And it was such an impactful way to engage with Aldi that even at the end of her life, she was like, no, 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 I need to make a CMOS album again, um, which I think is a really cool. Um, example of the staying power of different kinds of relationships with uh with nature um so that's a bunch of the pieces of our collection that we have sort of more like a, a artful or like poetic engagement with the history of algae um which again is one way that it became like acceptable especially for women to engage with those sorts of um with that part of science because it was seen as um less uh, well, there's probably a lot of reasons why that could be the case, um, but it, it definitely was seen as, as much more appropriate. Um, and then we have a couple more specimens in the collection that are, uh, you know, and we can show some of those later if you guys are interested, that more are individual display cards with, you know, scientific names. Someone was clearly building um, a more of a reference collection for looking at different um, algae. Um, so uh, we did want to talk about, so when people talk about this like sort of history, like we have this uh, evidence here in our collections, but again, we want to look at these different specimens and these different objects and artifacts and connect them out to the bigger story of like natural history in the world around us. Um, and there are some really prominent women um, who sort of fill out the story of, uh, of females, uh, scientists, and algae. Um, and one of them is Anna Atkins, um, who you can see here in this picture. Um, and she was born in 1799. Um, her father was like a prominent naturalist and she grew up as a trained botanist with sort of an unparalleled scientifically oriented education for women of the time. Um, and she, at the, you know, even though she was really um, excited about, you know, botany and she was excited about algae um, and she had a couple of other projects, she was barred from participating in the Linnaean Society, which was the Botanical Society of Britain at that time. But that didn't stop her from her interests and from getting excited. Um, when a, a friend and I think neighbor, William Herschel, was showing um, her how to like do cyanotypes, which is an early, um, was early on in the history of photography. Um, and so she produced a book called The Photographs, Photographs of British Algae, Cyanotype Impressions in about 1843, which is widely thought to be the first um, book that was illustrated by photographs. Um, and that's uh, particular, this kind of kelp picture to the right is from that book and if you actually go the British Library has digitized the whole thing so you can see all of them and they're incredible. Um, and then another woman that we kind of wanted to talk about was Margaret Gaddy. Um, so she was born in 1809 so you know she's a little bit older or a little bit younger than Anna Atkins um, and she these illustrations are from a book that she wrote called uh, British Seaweeds that was uh, published in 1848. And here at this time, she was one of several women who are not just like looking at these things, but writing specific guides about like, okay, there's all these amazing um, quotes in the book about how like, so you think you have to go to this garden party later and that makes you feel like you shouldn't put on a small boy's boots, work boots, to be able to go to the tide pool because you'll look unseemly. Well, let me tell you about nature's wonders of the tide pool. They are well worth looking unseemly at tea later today. 
Um, so it has a lot of advice like that where they're clearly expecting a sort of like genteel feminine audience to be partaking of this advice, but then they're still offering, you know, they're still saying it's worth it to get out there and then offering these great illustrations and this um, great identification advice. Um, and so, and then another one that we wanted to touch upon, which sort of, you know, in kind of an arc of how like women were able to access science is Kathleen Mary Drew Baker. Um, so she was born in 1901, so we kind of jumped forward. Um, and she is famous for, so she, you know, was able to like actually go to university, become a trained scientist, and is most famous for releasing a paper in 1949 um, that outlined her studies of the reproductive cycle of nori or periphera lessoniata. Um, so she was the one who particularly noticed that at a specific stage of its life, of its reproductive cycle, it really needed this certain kind of habitat um, that farmers who were trying to grow nori on an industrial scale kept, you know, pulling away these bivalves that this life um, stage needed to live on, um, thinking that they were being helpful and in fact they were destroying their own capacity for like large-scale productivity. So um, she's responsible for making, you know, that observation is responsible um, for making that a productive commercial industry. And there actually is still a festival that celebrates her in certain parts of Japan um, for how important that has been to Japanese food culture. Um, and one thing that's cool about her too is that you go from someone like Anna Atkins, you know, um, whose work primary, you know, um, well-known work came out in 1843, was not even allowed to join local societies. Um, and you jump forward, you know, to the 19, early 1950s, so almost 100 years, um, probably too long, but um, Kathleen Drew Baker, uh, actually with her, one of her best friends, co-founded the British Psychological Society, um, which is actually still the premier, like, organization for folks who study algae. In Great Britain, which is pretty rad. Um, and so that gets us to a point where uh, we have thought about, you know, like there's sort of this been this progression and how people are relating to different algae. Like we have people who've collected it, people who've made poems with it, um, different ways of studying it, um, and then, you know, and, and up to more like perhaps scientific industrial relationships and uses. Um, but I do want to mention, or I do want to point out that we are so excited about all these different ways. Um, to do this, uh, to engage with these specimens, to engage with the world that they come from, and we don't think any of them are more or less valuable. Um, and one thing that I got really excited about when I was talking to Michael, who I think is just about to join us for the collections close-up, um, is how many different stories he had of the different kinds of ways that people, you know, Californians were relating to the ocean, um, and how, you know, it because of that like strong relationship and that sense of value, even across different kinds of like uses, people are excited about conserving it. Um, so that's something that we wanted to talk to you today about. Michael, can you hear us? Are we here? I can hear you. I'm here. Can you guys hear me? I can hear All you. Right. I... <laughs> um, so thank you so much for joining us um, uh, to talk about this stuff with me a second time. Uh, and I wondered if you could start this conversation by um, giving just a brief overview for those who haven't read the blog of like what your work is um, and how it relates to Kelly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so thank you so much for uh, that introduction and thanks for, um, for what you just presented. That was really cool. I learned a lot just now that I didn't know about marine algae. So that was exciting. Um, and thanks also for the segue about women in science. Um, I think it's a good segue because one of the parts of my job that I'm, I'm honestly the most excited about is my, um, the, the ability to, to connect science to, to a lot of different diverse um, audiences, a lot of different diverse stakeholder groups. So yeah, my name is Mike Escrow. Um, I work for the California Ocean Protection Council. We serve as the governor's advisor on coastal and ocean policy. Um, I'm a marine ecologist by training, so my background is in kelp forest and rocky reef. Um, ecology, uh, applied marine science. I worked a lot on the marine protected area network that we have here in California. Um, and now I run the Marine Ecosystems Program at OPC. And so that means I basically get to work on all things ecosystem-based management, um, which is super challenging, but a lot of fun. So I work on everything from MPAs to ecosystem restoration and resilience, which is where my work with kelp comes in, um, aquaculture, biodiversity conservation, um, big ecological data. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of fun stuff, um, broad and, portfolio um, for sure. And, and kelp is one of the things I'm, I'm most excited about. Well, and so before we get to that, can, so MPA is for anyone who might not know, although, you know, this is an audience that's excited about algae, so maybe you already do, is marine protected area, right? Right, 
Yeah, and, and marine protected areas are kind of, um, I kind of describe them as our offshore state parks. So we have 124 of them all up and down the coast from San Diego to the Oregon border. And they're little areas that we've set aside for conservation. Um, it's 16% of our state water. So pretty, um, pretty significant amount of, uh, of our coastline is protected. And that's varying levels of protection. So in some places, fully protected, no fishing or anything like that. Other uh, areas, some, some kind of like light fishing allowed, um, but generally the idea is to preserve these areas for, for biodiversity. Um, which is obviously very cool uh, and has a huge scope, um, but we do, so, so of all of the projects that you have, uh, kelp is one that we are most excited about uh, for World Oceans Day and just like thinking about these sorts of like iconic forms of like life around us in California. Um, and you mentioned when we last talked that you kind of think the nice thing about kelp is that everyone pretty much knows what it is, even if you've only been to the ocean once or only like seen it, you know, in movies. Um, and can you talk a little bit about your work with kelp and like the state of kelp in California right now? Yeah, so, so you're right. I think everybody um, kind of knows what kelp is. You talked about, you know, seaweed, right? So everybody that's, that's uh, been to the beach has probably had some experience with seaweed, um, gone tide pooling, whatever it might be. And uh, kelp, you know, it, it provides a lot of, of what we call ecosystem services. Um, so kelp provides complex three-dimensional habitat. Um, kelp provides a food source for lots of things, for everything from urchins to abalone. A lot of people love diving for abalone, eating abalone. Um, provides uh, attenuation of wave energy, so it kind of can buffer the coastline against uh, severe storms. So kelp does a lot for our coast. Um, and, you know, it's, it's pretty iconic. Everybody, I think, has seen, uh, if, even if you haven't had the privilege of actually diving in a kelp forest, you've probably seen on National Geographic or something, these soaring underwater forests, you know, 30, 40, 50 feet tall. Um, it's really one of our most iconic underwater habitats here in California. Um, but the problem is that it's really under threat from climate change. So starting right about 2014, waters off of our coast started to get warmer. Um, we had uh, a strong El Nino event in I think 20, 2015 that was preceded by a year where there was this sort of weird warm water mass that was hanging out offshore um, of Northern California called the Blob. And this persistent warm water is really bad for kelp because kelp has a hard time growing in warm water. Warm water holds fewer nutrients. Um, and it really got hit by this perfect storm. So at the same time that this warm water was, was causing kelp to have trouble kind of growing and persisting, um, Warm water is also thought to have played a role in sea star wasting disease, which a lot of people on the coast have probably heard about. Um, very mysterious and, uh, and pretty tragic disease where you were seeing in 2014, you know, all up and down the West Coast, sea stars basically just melting, um, dissolving because of this virus. And sea stars are a major predator of sea urchins. So it's kind of this classic trophic cascade, right, where you lost the sea star population um, almost entirely. This one sea star called Pythopodia, the sunflower star, major predator of the purple sea urchin. Without that sea star, urchin populations spiked, and those urchin populations um, totally changed their behavior. They came out of their little cracks and crevices and started storming all over the reef and eating, actively grazing kelp rather than feeding on drift kelp as they, as they normally do. So, now the situation that you have um, are these, you know, miles and miles off the coast of what they call urchin barrens. So completely barren of any kelp, um, you know, let alone canopy, but even like understory and turf algae, those sort of shrubby things, some of you showed some examples of those, are pretty much gone. Um, so it's really an example of how climate change kind of completely uh, wiped out or, or almost, it was like 90 to 95 percent, um, wiped out this ecosystem in, in a really short amount of time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and that's like a whole bunch of different factors. Um, and it's interesting for me to think about like whenever you're trying to understand like an environmental issue, you're trying to understand like a complex interaction of several things. Um, and I guess I'm curious, like in your work, has that made it, is that, does that make it particularly hard to advocate for, I don't know, conservation because you're not sure whether or not you know someone is going to see all the different pieces you want to talk about or do you find ways to connect with people you know 
to, to build understanding even over these sorts of like complex problems. Yeah, I think, um, I guess if I were to identify, like kind of, there's kind of two answers to your question, right? So the, the first answer, and this is the reason, you know, again, that I really love my job is because I came from a hard science background, but one of the biggest problems with scientists is oftentimes they only talk to other scientists. And so science on this, I mean, it's only half the story. And even the scientists that you talk to, they don't fully agree or, you know, on exactly what causes problem or there's some nuances. So for example, I was just kind of describing how that classic trophic cascade helped to wipe out kelp um, back in 2014, 2015. But now we're starting to see some evidence that like, whoa, wait a minute, maybe it wasn't only the, the trophic cascade, but maybe there was like a huge recruitment event of purple sea urchins, or maybe ocean conditions were involved somehow. So like, like strong upwelling or transport or things like that. So the more that you dig into what the science says, the, the more complicated it gets. Um, but the other part of that is that you really, you need to talk to, my, my dog's got trouble. Um, you need to talk to people besides scientists. So you need to get out there among the community, you know, and talk to fishermen, talk to recreational divers, talk to indigenous communities. I think a lot um, about indigenous communities because we talk in ecology about this problem of shifting baselines where when you think about, okay, if I'm gonna restore a kelp forest, what's the baseline I wanna restore it back to? right? The density of kelp or the extent of kelp or whatever it might be. Well, we might have a baseline that goes back 150, 100, 200 years. Um, indigenous folks have a baseline that goes back millennia, right? As the original stewards of, of California's coast and ocean. So having those conversations and trying to figure out ways that you can, um, you can connect uh, with people. Um, you know, the vast majority of stakeholders that I talk to, whatever that stakeholder group might be, they all love the ocean. Um, people who use the ocean for to consume resources, fishermen, um, they're some of the most ardent conservationists that, that I've ever met. So I think it's really important to just kind of meet people where they are and, and try to um, appreciate the diverse perspectives that, that different kinds of groups and kinds of stakeholders can bring you because otherwise you're, you're never going to get to the picture. Yeah, and I, it's interesting for me to think about that. I know the first time that we talked, um, one thing that really stuck out to me as we were talking about the sort of the state of California's kelp forests is I think we talked about how in um, Northern California, it's more than 90%, we're saying more than 90% uh, destruction for the bull kelp forests that are up there. And yeah. I think yeah. in conversation, you were like, just imagine what would happen if more than 90% of the redwoods all of a sudden were gone. Yeah, yeah, so think about if within a year, 95% of the redwoods from you know Santa Cruz to Humboldt disappeared, and all that was left was bare dirt. I mean that that's the equivalent of that's what we're talking about. And think about all those ecosystem services that are provided by those trees. So all of the you know the habitat, the food, the shelter, just all of the web of life that that um, that ecosystem supports, that's gone too, right? Yeah, and and as like stark and painful as that reality is, it's. Uh, exciting for me coming from more the perspective of being sort of around like historical engagements with the natural world you know we have like photos of the Save the Redwoods League and people you know who they were like we heard this is an issue we're gonna go like party like it's 1850 in these redwoods to make sure people care about them you know you have all these like people in like full petticoats like hanging out in wagons like putting up banners in the forest um, and those seem like they people were like oh this is a problem we're gonna like rise to meet it um, and that's one of my favorite stories of like historical conservation. And I was wondering if you have any like favorite conversations or like memories of working with people on conservation for kelp or other issues. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I have a lot. I think one of, uh, so one of my favorite memories is um, going up to Fort Bragg to help out with an urchin removal event. So, um, you know, people, people really want to do something. Right? And so one of the things that they asked the state for permission to do is to gather large amounts of urchins, basically like a beach cleanup, right? Sort of like you're removing invasive species. Although urchins are a native species, it is important to remember that. I talked about the indigenous perspective a little while ago. I think it is important. Our you know, indigenous partners on this remind us all the time, like urchins aren't a villain. It's just that this whole thing is out of balance, right? So I, I do think it's important to remember that when we talk about purple urchin. But 
Um, there are too many of them, and we got to get a lot of them out of there. Like, there's no two ways about it. To bring back help, we got to kill a lot of urchins. And so that was one of the things that um, I went up to uh, to Fort Bragg to do is to participate in some urchin removals. And I, you know, it was just so great to, you know, I mean, I guess well before coronavirus, but um, you know, I used to sit in an office in Sacramento, right, and wear a button-down shirt every day. So it's so great to just like get out put on a wetsuit again, because that's the thing I love doing the most. Get out in the water with folks. You know, it's mostly abalone divers um, who are really interested in, in participating in this. And, you know, I, we filled up like five or six game bags full of urchins that day. And um, it was incredible. I mean, it was great. It was really, really hard and cold and a lot of work and urchins are spiky. It was kind of miserable, but it was at the same time, one of the most fun uh, work experiences I've had, because at the end of the day, we all felt like, you know what, I think we're making a difference. And Maybe it's just a drop in the bucket, but I'll tell you that there is some kelp that's persisting at that site. So we, we did kind of feel like we were defending the kelp. Um, and you know, in terms of how you scale that up, how you continue to involve recreational divers, how you involve maybe commercial divers, which is something I can talk about in a little bit. Um, that's, you know, that's, that's a different story. And, and that's, those are things that the state is kind of working on right now is how do we scale this up, right? But that was a, that was a good day. That, you know, Didn't you say that you got like, like spines in your finger? I did. I did get spines in my finger. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds rough. That's because um, I didn't have good gloves. <laughs> and that also, you know, you bring up the coronavirus and it's like hard sometimes because we, you know, are talking about it's such a, a large scale thing that is in some ways so new that it's hard to understand what kind of context, at least for me and my work, what it will have for like this space, other than knowing that, you know, I, I don't get to be here now, except very carefully and infrequently as, uh, as we, you know, try to be responsible, um, as responsible as possible. But um, I think when we last spoke, you mentioned uh, something about, you know, one of the ways coronavirus is uh, affecting like these sort of recovery efforts is it's influencing not just like how you're doing the science but also how you're able to like involve community partners like commercial divers mm -hmm. um would you want to talk about that a little bit more or? sure yeah i mean you know we are um as we're working to get this commercial urchin removal project going so i, I should back up a little bit and say that opc um, and the department of fish and wildlife together with reef check which is a, a citizen scientist volunteer diver organization um, we have launched a project where we're going to be paying commercial divers whose work you know uh, there's commercial divers up on the north coast who fish for red urchin but those reds have mostly been out competed by the purples so we have a lot of red urchin divers up there who have fairly limited work if they're not fully out of work. Um, and so they're ready, man, they're ready to go. They're ready to get out there and harvest purple urchin. And man, talking about removing urchin from the reef, like these guys know how to do it because it's their livelihood. So we're putting um, commercial urchin divers to work to go gather purples at three sites um, up in Mendocino County where, uh, where some of the urchin barrens are the worst. And so, yeah, we've, we've been kind of grappling with how to do that. That project was approved in February in March, obviously COVID hit. So we've been grappling with, all right, how do we, we still need to make this happen. I mean, ecological crises don't stop just because of a pandemic. So we still want to move that work forward. So we're looking at things like social distancing on vessels, you know, potentially less citizen scientist involvement initially um, until we can kind of get, you know, get some more protocols wrapped around uh, that. It could be as simple as, you know, fewer citizen scientists in the water doing the monitoring um, while the commercial divers are gathering at one time. So, you know, we're, we're going to make it happen, um, but, but it has slowed things down a bit and it has required us to, to think through how we can get it done safely because we certainly don't want to, you know, um, put anybody in jeopardy. Uh, it's a very serious virus that's going on, but, you know, we, we can still move the work forward. So that's good. Awesome. Um, so we are, yeah, so we're just going to get to our final question and it seems like we already have some comments in the chat and we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Um, but if there is a number one thing that people can do, or like what are the, the main takeaways for folks who are trying to help with kelp conservation? Um, what are the things that they should know or what are the things they should do? For, for people who are interested in getting involved? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so, well, we talked about this a little bit last time you and I chatted. I mean, I think there's, there's things you can do at different scales. Um, so the, the number one thing is to vote. Honestly, you know, what I do is I staff high level decision makers. So I work with scientists, I work with stakeholders, I work with indigenous folks and fishermen, and I try to come up with recommendations 
to inform the decision makers about what kind of decisions to make. But if, if they don't have the same priorities, right, then it doesn't matter how well I do my job. Um, they're they're going to make different decisions. So I think voting and making sure that there are people in those positions of power um, whose values align with yours. And if your value happens to be, you know, fighting climate change, then, um, you know, then I think you should, you should send that message at the ballot box, right? So that's a big thing, obviously. Um, there's also other things people can do to reduce their own carbon footprint, because again, you know, I really want to reiterate that this is a climate driven problem. Um, and then in terms of things that folks can do on a smaller scale, um, you know, again, we're really looking at ways that recreational dive communities can be involved in this. So I mentioned urchin removals up north. I know there's a big push right now to get something similar going on in Monterey. You can sign up with Reef Check to work as a volunteer diver to help monitor the health of these kelp forests. Um, so, you know, there's, there's really no shortage of things you can do. You can educate friends, you can educate yourself. Um, there's lots of resources, and I think you said you're going to be sending some of those resources out. Um, so, so I think there's, you know, there'll be there'll be plenty of things to to choose from if you're interested. Cool. And uh, I think I'll jump in now too. Thank you both so much. We have um, had a number of comments and questions, and um, kind of going off of what you've both been talking about recently um, with actually like so the difference between voting and what that means versus like actually getting your hands out there someone um joining us today appears to be a diver and is um uh speaking about the lack of ability for divers to actually go and collect urchins because of um oversights that, uh, pretty much limiting people from doing that and so i'm curious if maybe we could talk a little bit about um multiple angles of that, maybe from foraging to, so foraging ethics and laws, and then also um, just like how do we actually go about, um, maybe if someone wants to not just vote, but also go out and get some urchin, um, what, are, what are some things that need to happen to, to make that be able to happen? Yeah, so I talked about that push for, for divers to be able to cull urchins in Monterey. Um, and that's something that, you know, OPC is not directly involved in because the regulatory authority for that is actually the Fish and Game Commission. Um, so three agencies, OPC, Fish and Game Commission, Department of Fish and Wildlife, we all work very closely together, but we have very different responsibilities. So OPC is the policy lead, um, like I said, for coasts and oceans, whereas Fish and Game Commission is a regulatory authority. The uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife is the managing agency. So there is a petition right now with the Fish and Game Commission to allow for urchin culling in Monterey. Um, I can't really speak to the status of that petition right now, because like I said, it's with another agency. But, you know, in general, I think this is one of the things that, that makes this so complicated is that we're, you know, we know urchins are a problem, right? But our job is to make science informed decisions. And so we need to really have a full understanding of what the science says before we, and I say we meaning the state, not just OPC, but before a regulation is changed, we need to have a really thorough, solid scientific backstop of why it makes sense to change that regulation, right? And so what we're doing right now for urchin culling, um, this is getting a little bit in the, in the weeds here, but I mentioned that gathering, that urchin gathering process that I participated in. That's kind of tough and arduous. And so a lot of recreational divers are saying, well, why can't we just crush urchins in, uh, in, in situ, right, underwater. Um, that's a very valid argument. So what the Fish and Game Commission has done is they've permitted in, because that's illegal um, under normal, normal regulations. So what the Fish and Game Commission has done is they've um, allowed in-water urchin calling at one site only in Casper Cove up in, uh, in Northern California. And over the next few months, we're going to kind of see how that unfolds and see how that goes and, and see if that's something that the state could support more broadly. Um, so, you know, we are very open to listening to our stakeholders and trying to, to test things out and, and do it in a science-informed way. Um, but it can be really tough to change the regulations. And honestly, I mean, the folks that I've met who are, who are getting involved in that fight and really trying to, to pressure the state to change regulations and to do things to, to help the kelp, I mean, I, I really have so much admiration and respect for that. Um, we're, trying to, we're trying to work as close as we can with stakeholders while still upholding our mandate to, to make science informed 
decision. Does that kind of answer answer the question? Yeah, I think so. And yeah. it sounds like um, the what you were recommending of people looking into reef check. That's about getting that information right, so that eventually right. policies can change. So that's good advice. And people right. um, are are um, also interested uh, in in this urchin topic somewhere. Um, curious about what you do with the urchins when you do call them, and also if there is an uh, a surge in urchins, does that mean there's also a surge in otters? Good questions. Um, so first of all, what do we do with the urchins when we remove them from the water? Um, people can really do whatever they want with them. I've seen a lot of cool little uh, arts and crafts that have been, that people have made from the urchin tests. So little Christmas ornaments or mobiles or something like that. I got a bunch of urchin tests decorating my, my office. They're kind of pretty. But for, you know, by and large, honestly, they get used as compost. Um, and uh, that's, yeah, that's where they go, is, is to the compost heaps. Um, but in terms of otters, that's a very interesting question. So otters eat a lot of stuff, obviously. Otters have to eat a lot. Um, and urchins are a preferred prey item for otters in normal times, I guess I should say some otters, but only if the urchins are in good condition. So generally what we're seeing in the, on the Central Coast where there are otters is that otters generally don't like to eat urchins that are that are obtained from urchin barrens because if you think about it you know if you, if you crack open an urchin like if you ever eaten uni that's what you're eating you're eating the gonad mass inside of a sea urchin and so to, to make that you know delicious yellow uh, urchin gonad the row they've got to eat a lot of seaweed um, and if there's no seaweed if they're in an urchin barren they're not going to be able to eat they're basically starving if you crack them open there's nothing inside there um, and so that's, you know, that's kind of a, a, a scientific question right now is like, well, are the otters still eating them? And, and generally what, what folks are finding is that um, otters don't eat starving urchins. Um, I'm also curious for both of you, and maybe actually Kathleen, you might have um, a different perspective on this. Uh, just again, this, this topic of foraging, because what we've been talking about with our collections at the museum are things that that individuals, whether scientists or amateur collectors, foraged. And then we've also been talking about maybe collecting urchins and, and, and uh, there's a comment about abalone. Um, so maybe Kathleen, can you speak a little bit about um, foraging ethics for the museum as well as maybe for individuals who might be inspired by the sea moss albums um, or about the Anna Atkins cyanotypes or maybe want to eat some delicious nori. Um, can you speak a little bit about uh, foraging? Um, yeah, so I mean uh, one thing that I do, I really liked how you articulated it in the algae guide. I don't know if any of you guys have had a chance to look at the algae guide that Marisa wrote and put together, um, but it's beautiful and really informative. And um, I think one of the big takeaways um, about, so some of the main takeaways that we covered there and that I also think about when we we're talking about like, you know, um, promoting the collections um, is that you wanna, um, you wanna know what you're collecting. Um, you wanna do research on like the local laws for the areas. A lot of places where you might wanna collect um, locally are, and we can add this to the resource side if people are interested, um, there's recreational harvesting is governed in a lot of places locally by the California Fish and Wildlife Department. Um, and so they have some really good um, rules. And basically there's like certain kinds of uh, specimens for at least algae you can't collect. Um, and then you also have like a limit on a certain amount that you can collect. Um, so there's some ins and outs there that it's best to look directly at local regulations. Um, but then you also kind of just want to be thoughtful about like not just like knowing what you're collecting but like knowing that like this is a shared resource that everyone needs to have access to you want to be responsible about that so you don't want to like hog things um or you don't want to you know if you see only one of a particular like thing you don't want to take just one of those you want to see if there's like a bunch in the area depending on what you're looking at um and then i guess just broadly speaking for me what i think about a lot which might not be as relevant for the average collector, but maybe it is because we rely on this knowledge a lot, is thinking about how like a lot of the things that have been collected historically in museums um, were not collected the right way, should not have been collected and have these like legacies of, of sort of grappling with the ethics of, you know, how many of these things were taken or how these people were treated or what was taken from them. And so just in the act of collecting, like getting excited about that moment of joy and connection, but also being thoughtful of sort of the bigger um, history of what it means to know the world that way. So in, through the act of collecting things. 
Uh, Michael, do you have anything to add about collecting and foraging before we wrap up? Um, I guess two things. First off, you know, um, again, what I said about hunters and fishermen being some of the most ardent conservationists that, that I've ever met. Um, so I think in terms of foraging ethics, uh, I, that's the first time I've heard that term and I like it. Um, but, I, you know, all these, you know, abalone divers that I, I've talked to and somebody in the chat made a good point that abalone, um, abalone season is closed. Abalone fishing is completely forbidden um, until at least the spring of 2021. Uh, and that's because abalone populations as a result of the kelp collapse have gotten so critically low. So I appreciate whoever made that comment. Um, that is important to mention. And, you know, we're hoping that it comes back. Um, that's dependent, obviously, on how the resource does. But, but yeah, I think, um, you know, all, all these divers and fishermen that I've talked to, very, very strong uh, ethics around, around the practices that connect them to the ocean. And then the other thing is kind of more of a practical piece of advice is just know where you're going. Um, know what the rules are. If you're going to get out there and fish or collect or, or do anything, um, chances are there's a rule about it. So educate yourself before you get out there, you know, to go fishing or go collecting, you know, tide pooling, whatever it is, um, and, uh, and be knowledgeable. Um, you know, there's, there's tons of ways to enjoy collecting, fishing, hunting um, legally and, and being smart about it. So just, just know what you're doing. Awesome. Um, and I did want to, we're going to be wrapping up, but I wanted to share um, with everyone some resources that we're going to be sharing out in an email after this program. We'll also have a, a link to a survey that we hope that you'll take a moment to, um, to participate in so that we can um, better serve you as members. Um, but uh, within this list of resources, we uh, include our guide to algae of the Monterey Bay, which does have a note about foraging ethics that Kathleen mentioned, um, as well as the blog that this is an extension of, um, which Kathleen writes up every month. So you can also go back and view um, just a trove of, of many other interesting um, stories about the museum's collections. And then we get into a lot of resources about algae and about the work that Michael and the state um, does. And so we'll be set, uh, sharing this with everyone um, uh, later. Uh, so I think that is our time. And so I want to just take a moment to, to thank Kathleen and to thank Michael for, um, for taking the time to join us today. And um, to all of you out there for being members um, and for also joining us today, we're going to uh, put the recording of this on the website and send out a link to you all. And we're going to do this again next month. This is going to be a monthly occurrence. Um, and Kathleen, do you want to share what we're going to be talking about next month? Well, okay, so we haven't fully decided, but um, I think we're gonna do something from our malacology collection. So we have um, so many different um, seashell specimens from uh, you know, near and far, um, and it's not something that we've gotten to talk about too much lately um, in the exhibit halls, even if they were open. So it's been something that's been on my mind to focus on um, uh, a lot lately. And so I'm really excited to do that. Um, and then definitely for um, those of you who get the survey, well, so we should all get the survey link. Um, please give feedback on just like how we're doing this spatially, like if the slides were good, if you want us to make more of an effort to like see parts of the collection space. Um, we really are interested in sort of getting to what you guys are most interested about the the blog or the presentation version of the close up. So please do let us know. Okay, wonderful. Um, so thanks again for joining us. We're gonna we're gonna say goodbye now. Uh, but we'll see you next month and we hope to see you at the museum soon. Stay tuned for, for information about that. Okay. Bye everyone. Thanks everybody. Thank you.